Hi, welcome to the Fraser Virtual Museum. My name is Melinda and today it's Labor Day. So I hope you get to relax a little bit and take the day off. Uh, and of course, we wanted to commemorate the people who fought so hard for our labor rights that we enjoy today. So you might be wondering why I'm wearing white. And the reason comes as no surprise, especially if you've seen a lot of our videos before. But the same people who fought for labor reform also fought for women's suffrage. In the late 1800s, a lot of working class women were realizing that in order to protect themselves at work, they also needed some level of political autonomy, meaning they needed the right to vote. Harriet Stanton Blatch was the daughter of Elizabeth Cady Stanton, and Harriet understood that she needed to start extending a hand to trade union leagues. She also felt that the sort of um, upper crusty tactics of you know, tea parties and fundraisers and writing to your friend's husband in the legislature wasn't really aggressive enough and it wasn't, um, it wasn't gonna move the cause forward very quickly. She wanted to integrate a more aggressive, um, more aggressive tactics from the labor activists who were already using them. This was gonna help them get a lot more publicity and um, organize things like parades in the streets. So by the 1910s, if you've ever seen photographs of women in white dresses marching down the street, not only was that considered militant and aggressive at the time, but it also started getting media attention and inviting more women to join, and it ultimately became a very successful strategy. Labor laws weren't just important to women at the time, they were also important for the same women's children. About 3 million children between ages 10 and 16 were working in factories or they were wage earners of some kind. So labor reformers wanted child labor abolished completely. They wanted shortened hours. They wanted a minimum wage. Um, they wanted pensions for mothers. Uh, they advocated for education reform. A lot of suffragists were conducting what they called trolley tours uh, where they would do these traveling campaigns where they weren't lecturing in a, a wealthy woman's salon or at the dinner table anymore. They were lecturing right outside the factories. They took their campaign directly to the front door. So during lunchtime or at the end of a shift, workers could gather around the soapbox and hear about uh, you know new political ideas. One of these suffragists was named Emily Pearson up in Connecticut and uh, there was one speech that she gave in particular that was absolutely captivating and it drew 400 workers from the Underwood Typewriter Company to come and listen to her speak. And after the event, one writer reported, there's being born among women, particularly women in the more oppressive and poorly paid lines of labor, a feeling of solidarity, a feeling that what injures one hurts the cause of all and that the only way the world can be forced to recognize their rights and grant them is by means of organized labor. There was one story that I found that I thought was really captivating, and the story goes that uh, a, a woman in a mill somewhere w passed by like a, a dirty window with grime all over it, and she casually wrote votes for women in the grime, and a male floor manager was so angered by what he saw that he stormed over and he wiped down the glass immediately and um, that was that. And by the end of the day, uh, the incident had almost been completely forgotten about, except that the next morning when the women came in to work again, they saw that the managers had wiped clean every single window on the floor. But not all men were against women's suffrage. In fact, there were many male trade unionists who did help fight for women's suffrage. And the reason was because if you can get more voters um, that are lending their voices to uh, the trade union leagues and uh, labor reform, then you can actually get those laws passed and you'd have more of a voice in government. It's interesting to look at political parties during this era since the ones I'm gonna mention don't exist anymore, but uh, the populist party was the one that was very much advocating for women's right to vote. Um, they were a coalition of farmers, uh, small business owners, for example, and, and other workers. And they were concerned with the very tight concentration of wealth at the top of the country. And they understood that um, that very small group of people had such a tight grasp on the U.S. economy 
that the populist party wanted to democratize the economy more. They felt that the wealth gap was becoming incredibly dangerous. And so if you can expand uh, the, the worker's voice in, in incorporating women, then perhaps um, their cause would be advanced. And when you look at specific states like Colorado, maybe, in Colorado, women affirmed the right to vote in 1893. And that is directly credited to the Populist Party. What's interesting is that in 1893, that same year, the U.S. experienced a huge stock market crash and it took years to recover. Later, after the Populist Party dissipated, a lot of the values from that party ended up being incorporated into uh, the progressive movement at the turn of the century. And by the 1910s, we can see a lot of really famous progressive women, uh, people like Mary Church Terrell, who were lecturing all over the country. Uh, Mary was the first black woman credited with earning a college degree. Jane Addams, for example, who was based in Chicago, founded the Hull House, which was a community school that offered legal services to recent immigrants, helped teach them English, offered kindergarten and education programs at the time. And uh, the model for this was actually adopted by many other cities, including here in Louisville, uh, when the Neighborhood House was founded. And the Neighborhood House still exists today. You'll also recognize the name Ida B. Wells. She was a Tennessee journalist who was uh, vocally anti-lynching, and she was calling attention to white supremacy in the South. She is also famously one of the co-founders of the NAACP. Turning our attention back north, there were a lot of recent immigrants, as I mentioned, who were also working in the garment district. They insisted that only with suffrage would they be able to ever hope for equal pay and other basic necessities, like humane working hours, as we mentioned. Um, and to highlight Rose a little bit more, Rose Schneiderman was described as a tiny red-haired bundle of social dynamite. She was a leading voice in the trade union movement for over 50 years. Um, but just to focus on this time period, she was a Jewish Polish American. She came to America in 1890. And um, at the time, in the, the garment district, if you were to work there, you were taking a huge personal risk. That industry was notoriously dangerous, but it was a lot more lucrative. So women were more willing as wage earners for their family to actually go and take the risk. In 1908, Rose became the very first full-time organizer of the Women's Trade Union League. This was just before the, the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory fire. Over 100 women and children died in this fire because they weren't able to escape the building because their employers had locked all of the emergency exits because they didn't want their workers to leave their shift early. This became a huge point uh, of tension in that decade because um, labor reformers were really concerned that government officials were not going to hold their employers accountable for the things that happened like the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory fire. Suffice it to say, Rose was also deeply involved in the suffrage movement, and because of her work in both campaigns, she became the, the first woman president of that organization. And even then, because there were men in the league, she still faced a lot of discrimination because she was fighting for um, women's rights as well. For example, um, the women's minimum wage was different from men's. In 1911, the wage earners League for Women's Suffrage was founded, and they were distributing flyers that said, why are you paid less than a man? Why do you work in a fire trap? Why are your hours so long? Because you are a woman and you have no vote. Votes make the law. The law controls conditions. Women who want better conditions must vote. Even with everything mentioned in this video today, it still took over 72 years and a world war in order to pass the 19th Amendment in 1920. And we just recently celebrated the centennial this past week. Uh, however, it still didn't grant every woman the right to vote. So the black community, Asian Americans, and Native Americans especially, still faced many barriers to being able to vote and exercise their voice as well. So if you're enjoying your Labor Day today and you're getting to relax, um, I really do hope that you take a moment to consider uh, what it means to vote in November. 
thank you so much for watching and we'll see you in the next video bye